So I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm Professor Carolyn Dudek from the Department of Political Science and the Director of European Studies here at Hofstra University. And I am very, very pleased to have our speaker today. Um, I know that all of you are uh, watching the news, um, very disturbing news, war in Europe. And um, I thought that it'd be really helpful to invite a speaker who has had a career in this part of the world and understanding the relationship between East and West, understanding international relations more broadly. And so this talk today is sponsored by the European Studies Program here at Hofstra University and the College of Arts and Sciences. And it's also co-sponsored by the Hofstra Cultural Center. And I just wanna thank them so much because they pulled together this event so quickly with all the publicity, the beautiful posters, um, Athlean Collins and Carol Mallison. Thank you so much for um, pulling this together quickly and always doing as always an amazing, amazing professional job. Um, so it is with my uh, absolute pleasure to invite Professor Ronald Linden to speak to us today. Um, professor Linden is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pittsburgh, where he served as director of the European Studies Center and the director of the Center for Russian and East European Studies. At the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War in Europe, Dr. Linden was director of research for Radio Free Europe in Munich. In 2009, he was invited to contribute to the volume, The Berlin Wall, 20 years later, published by the US Department of State. At Pitt, he taught undergraduate and graduate courses on world politics, East Europe, and comparative foreign policies. And I have to add in, I was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh at the time, and I was his teaching assistant, and I would get to sit in on his lectures, so I know he's an amazing lecturer and will keep you all riveted. Dr. Linden held numerous national and international fellowships. He was a Fulbright Schumann Scholar in Rome and a DAAD Research Fellow at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies in Washington, D.C. He was a Transatlantic Academy Fellow at the German Marshall Fund and received research grants from the National Council for Eurasian and East European Research and from the International Research and Exchange Board. He has been a Fulbright Research Scholar, a Fulbright Distinguished Lecturer, a Research and Guest Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and a Senior Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace. His publications focus on international relations of Europe, Russia and Turkey, and most recently on the impact of Chinese trade and investment in Europe. So without further ado, I present to you Professor Ronald Linden. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm assuming everyone can see and hear me. Uh, and let me uh, thank you for inviting me and let me echo your thanks to the Hofstra Cultural Center for getting out the information on me and putting it out so quickly. My only complaint is they didn't find a picture of me that makes me better looking, but we'll, we'll uh, go into that uh, next time. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this uh, topic. Uh, it's a terrifying one. This is, a, this is not a happy occasion. And of course, it, it gets worse. Um, we are witnessing Perhaps something probably none of us ever expected to see in the 21st century, an old fashioned war and, and terrible war in Europe, an invasion, uh, the murder of innocents, the bombing of civilians, the bombing of cities. Um, and it's, it's, and the West trying to respond, including the United States and the countries around it. And there are implications not only for Ukraine, of course, and most directly for its people, but for its neighbors, uh, for the future of Europe, and for what it means uh, for the Western democracies and um, for uh, global politics. When I watched a very moving Zoom with my colleagues from Pitt who are in Kiev, someone asked them what we could do. And apart from the usual suggestions of donations and others, one of my colleagues said, you have to get the story out. 
You have to say what's happening. You have to tell the story so that people know what's going on, not only in its human dimensions, but in understanding the background, the dynamics, and how we came to this situation. Uh, what we can do, especially uh, academics and students and those who pay attention to world politics, is try to get the story, get the story right, and be ready for the disinformation and the waves of lies that will be perpetrated. So I consider my work, my uh, talk today, to be a contribution towards that. And I'm going to, if I can, take you on a bit of a journey. I am going to share the screen. Uh, and I'm hoping you can all see that. Everyone can see that all right? Yep. Looks good, yes. Okay. I'd like to begin by introducing you to Ilya. Picture taken here when he was about 100 years old. Ilya has lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He lived in an independent Poland, the Second Republic. He lived in the West Ukrainian People's Republic. He lived in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in the USSR. Unfortunately, he also lived in the general government under the Nazis and back in the USSR. He was fortunate at the end of his life to live in an independent Ukraine. Here's the thing, he never left his village. When you are Ukrainian, history comes to you and that's what has happened to the people and the country of Ukraine. I call this talk Borderland in the Crosshairs, and it is indeed, and it's a theme throughout um, the, the episodes that we'll be looking at. Ukraine um, was actually, Kiev was the, the home, the center, the origins of the modern Russian state uh, in Kiev and Rus. <clears throat> and uh, a key date that's often mentioned is 988 when Vladimir, the pagan leader of this region, decided he actually did this. He talked to all the religious leaders around him, the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians, and decided which religion would be best for him and therefore for his people. Um, and uh, he chose orthodoxy and thus was born the, the original Russian state uh, and, its attempt, and its connections to the Orthodox Church. It didn't last long because of Mongol invasions that you can see indi indicated here. Um, and the, the Mongols, as I'm sure all of you know, conquered this whole area. But soon after some time, the Russians were able to reacquire this, uh, acquire this area. You see the map indicates uh, uh, accretions by Russia growing areas taken by the Russian emperors. There is no Ukraine yet. This map, I like this map. It's one of the ones I, on the reading I sent to Professor Dudek because it shows what you might call the putative borders of Ukraine. These are the modern borders. Ukraine doesn't exist at this point, but you can see how it's taken over uh, by Russia and some part by um, Austria-Hungary. We're going to keep an eye on Lviv as we go through these maps because it's a good way of showing how, as I said, history comes to you. Let's remember that in the 19th century and right before World War I, this is what Europe looked like. There was no, there were, it was just empires, the German, the Austro-Hungarian or the Austrian, and the Russian. There's no Poland, there's no Czechoslovakia, there's no Yugoslavia, and there's no Ukraine. By the way, here's Lviv called Lemberg in, in those days. And so Ukraine, such as it was, and it wasn't, looked like this. Most of it still inside the Russian Tsarist Empire and some in the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. But after World War I, the Europe looked like this. This is quite a different picture. You have a restored Polish state for the first time in 120 years, a new state of Czechoslovakia, reduced Austria and Hungary, Romania doubled, a new state of Yugoslavia. You still have no Ukraine, 
but um, this map indicates, and this map in particular, there was a brief moment where there were several fighting Ukrainian states or factions really. Uh, and in the end, and it mirrored the civil war that went on inside Russia during this time, in 1922, what had been a brief independent Ukrainian state was absorbed into the Soviet Union and the Western part, part of the new Poland. So it, there was still no independent Ukraine and it was still divided. And here's Lvov. So the Russian empire, which had existed for hundreds of years under various odds, had looked like this, you see, no Poland, no Ukraine, no independent Baltic states. And the Russian uh, Soviet Republic, which was established in 1922, here's Ukraine, looked like this. A gigantic, a gigantic country, one sixth of the Earth's surface. I used to tell my students that if you pick up the globe, uh, when they used to have globes, and turn it in your hand, there is no way you can do it without seeing a piece of the Soviet Union. It is still a huge country, but it is immense from this period until, until its collapse. There was a period when much of it was taken over by the Nazis. This map shows the, the Russian advance deep into Russia and, and of course Ukraine. The war was incredibly brutal. Um, you, once again, the Ukrainians fell under, in this case, it was actually under two parts of the Nazi rule, the commissariat here and the, and the um, general gubernament here, and there's Lvov. When the war ended, once again, the borders of East Europe were changed. If you look closely at this map, you'll see these had been, the red lines had been the borders of the Soviet Union before World War II. And these became the borders. Poland was simply shifted, pushed west. Territory taken from Germany. We won't go into what happened up here. Um, and what had been the western part of Ukraine, and here's Lvov again, was now absorbed into the, the Ukrainian SSR, which is to say uh, the Soviet Union. It's part of a it, it's certainly part of a Russian slash Soviet attitude that these countries and these peoples are pawns to be pushed around for the purposes of the great powers or as they saw themselves. This map, I like this map. This is a very, this is a close up view of the border in 1930 and in 1945. Um, I'm closing my, uh, there we go. Uh, you'll see this was the border of Ukraine, Soviet Union, before World War II. It had a border with Poland and Romania. Here's Lvov inside Poland. After the border looked like this. Now notice, just in case this is in the way, now notice Lvov is inside the Soviet Union and notice something else. There are new borders, not only with Poland, but with Czechoslovakia Hung and Hungary. The Soviet Union created these borders so that they would have direct access to their subordinate satellite states in East Europe. So they could, if necessary, invade them. And they did. Hungary in 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968. None of this changed, well, it did change the essence of Ukraine because the Western provinces were returned or joined. Um, and in a, this map also shows a, a critical moment when Khrushchev in his power simply ceded Crimea to the Ukraine uh, in 1954. So the Soviet Union looked like this until its collapse. Just to give you an idea of the size of this country, this is Kazakhstan, a part of the Soviet Union. All by itself, Kazakhstan is and was bigger than all of West Europe. These are gigantic land masses pushed around by the powers who ruled in Moscow and sometimes in Berlin 
but most recently in Moscow, and there is Ukraine. Finally, in 1991, um, the country became independent when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, and you had new countries, not just Ukraine, but Belarus and the three um, independent Baltic republics. This is the country uh, as we know it now. And the, the cities that probably most people couldn't have found if you gave them a map of Ukraine before the recent terrible events, but now these have been in the news. Kharkiv, Mariupol, which well, used to be called the Zhdanov in the Russian days, Odessa, uh, Lviv, my personal favorite, Konatop, because at the beginning of the 20th century, my grandfather left Konatop to come to the United States, a story I'll return to. Now, when you, let me go back to, when Ukraine became independent, it didn't leave behind the debt, the, um, residue of all these changes. It didn't all of a sudden emerge as a um, unified, uh, homogeneous country. It brought with it the peoples who'd been part of it. Most importantly, in the last census, there hasn't been one since 2001. By ethnic identity, the country was 77% Ukrainian and 17% Russian. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Crimea, which you know uh, has been annexed by the Russians, was, was much more Russian, maybe six, almost 60%. This, this ethnic identity is misleading. When I traveled there and the various times I went there, um, much more significant was this map and much more significant now. This is the map of the country by native language by measuring Russian as a native language. These parts of the country, the ratio is very high as, and of, of uh, Russian as a native language, as you can see here, all throughout here and Donetsk and Luhansk, it's much higher. Whereas the further west you go, the lower becomes the percentage of native speakers uh, whose, whose, whose uh, first language or native language might be Ukrainian. But when I visited the country, except in the West, everybody spoke Russian. And, and people, identif people said to me in Russian, I am Ukrainian. So this business of language and identity was confusing and difficult. And it's kind of an indicator, not terribly exact, but a pretty good approximation of political proclivities, which I'm, I'm about to prove. In, when independent Ukraine emerged, uh, I want to point out right off the bat, I'm going to come back to this theme, uh, Russia was quite weak. It was weak in its region, it was weak in Europe, it was weak uh, nationally, internationally. And it couldn't do very much about the obvious interest of the West in getting Ukraine into the Western camp. The, especially the EU and especially Poland. In 2004, Ukraine experienced what's referred to as the Orange Revolution. Elections had made this man, Viktor Yanukovych, Yanukovych, president, but the election was widely considered to be rigged and, and not up to democratic standards and, standards, and the EU pushed very hard to overturn the election and instead have new elections which elected Viktor Yushchenko, which is exactly what happened in, two, in 2004. Um, and, and though Russia was unhappy about that, there was nothing they could do about it. And so at the begin, from the beginning of, 19, of 2004 on, the country developed a strong relationship with the EU, improving their, they became a partner country, uh, improving their trade relations, which I'm about to show. Um, this map shows the growth of EU trade with Ukraine. By 2012, both exports uh, and imports, the EU was the largest trade partner for Ukraine by a lot. 
a trend which continued right up until 2018. The EU was also the most significant source of financial aid, pouring billions into the country, but not offering membership. That was never in play. They were not on the fast track or the slow track uh, or the long track to join the way the East European countries did. Instead, their relationship was based on, part, on partnership agreement, um, priority agreement uh, uh, of trade. Um, well, so while the E, and I'm going to come, I'm going to go to this in the future. Um, EU membership grew. It grew to the border of Ukraine, but did not offer, as they say in Brussels, membership was not on offer. The EU wanted everything but, and the Ukrainians seemed to want it as well. Trade improvement. They eventually got visa-free travel. The, instead. The EU offered Eastern partnership with the countries who were not in line to join. They were not even candidate countries. They were behind Turkey. They were behind the Balkans. And to this day, well, we'll come back to that, that that's not an option. They, the EU pushed for an association agreement, which would have many of the parameters of a membership in terms of democratic uh, standards, implementations, um, and trade and connections, but not include membership. As the decade went on, the, the EU pushed for it ever strongly and the Russians were more and more unhappy because it would have solidified Ukraine's essentially its absorption into the Western um, economies, Western Europe, where most Ukrainians felt they belonged without formal, without formal membership. And in 2012, ironically under Viktor Yanukovych, Ukraine signed such an agreement, whereupon um, the Russians began bribing and threatening Yanukovych and the Ukrainians, and he suspended that agreement, which led to huge demonstrations in 2014 called the Euromaidan. You've probably seen pictures of this where ordinary Ukrainians took to the streets they were upset and unhappy with corruption and many other deficiencies in Ukrainian democracy, but they certainly didn't want um, a Russian supported president to pull out the rug from their connections to. And so um, there was upheaval, Yanukovych fled, and the Ukrainians in fact signed the agreement. They signed actually an agreement that includes a deep and comprehensive free trade area, the closest you can imagine to membership without membership. Uh, lots of contacts, uh, political standards and, invo and involvement. In this respect, it was a colossal failure for the Russians, but adnaka, as the Russians would say. The Russians supported unrest in the eastern part of the country, Luhansk and Donetsk, and as you know, I'm sure, seized Crimea, um, declared Khrushchev gifting of Crimea to be invalid, and seized it um, where conflict and conflict, of course, broke out. And so you had the country since um, 2014 has looked like this until today, until this current fighting. Now, some, I'm going to come back to this, but some of this has to do with the Russian view of Ukraine and the fear of democracy, but some of it is good old fashioned geopolitics. Let's take a closer look at you, Crimea, and you can see there's an, an, an airport, an air base, a massive naval base uh, here, and, and the connection, which I'll come to in a minute, to to Russia. If you look at this from a geostrategic point of view, here's the Black Sea, NATO member Romania, NATO member Bulgaria, NATO member Turkey. Crimea is now in Russian hands and has been since 2014 with a naval base. If you, if you look at it from the standpoint of connecting with Donbass, which is precisely what they're trying to do now, you can see the huge geostrategic advantage that the Russian Navy and its forces and its military would have, have had in this, in this area, 
even before war, which produced surging of, of forces. Just to make sure that that was solidified, in this area here, the Kerch Straits, the Russians decided they needed to connect the landmass of Russia, which is here, with their new state. And so they built this bridge, a fairly impressive structure, so that you can now overland go from anywhere in Russia across into, into Crimea um, without having to get on the water or travel through uh, un, uh, uh, hostile places in Ukraine. Fighting continued until 2015 with the so-called Minsk Agreement. There are actually two of them. The most important one is so-called Minsk II, provided for, now this is just between the Ukrainian national forces and the rebels in Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, provided for these terms, ce a ceasefire, pardon, an exchange of prisoners, <clears throat> withdrawal of heavy weapons, restoration of full control of the borders by Ukraine, withdrawal of all foreign forces, and interim self-government in Donetsk and Luhansk secured by a constitutional change, which would have provided for decentralization. This was all given the blessing by the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe, with support by outside powers. Unfortunately, it didn't work because these key provisions were never enacted. Ukraine was never had control of its borders. The Russians denied that their troops were there, so they weren't obliged to withdraw them because they said they weren't there in the first place. And the Ukrainian government in Kiev was not interested in implementing constitutional changes, which would have given more power uh, to uh, those provinces. So, in a, so Minsk, while hopeful and ended the fighting, did not produce um, movement towards some sort of, of, of solution. But perhaps the most important aspect, I think, is even if it had been fully implemented, or especially if it had been fully implemented, it wouldn't have provided what the Russians really wanted then and want now, which is a subordinate state that they can control um, both domestically and internationally, and that is one that they can uh, treat like a province uh, inside Russia, even if it is not in. This agreement did not produce that. And it, uh, the failure to produce that uh, led to the current invasion. Let me get to that by uh, trying to address it this way. Why now? This is just a situation that's been like this since 2015. Why are we seeing, why have we seen uh, this terrible uh, movement of armies, something we never thought we'd saw, see in contemporary Europe? Why now? Let me divide it into uh, underlying proximate and immediate conditions. An, an critical underlying factor is the Russian view of Ukraine as and Ukrainians is not a separate, legitimate, different people. They are little Russians, little brothers. And now that you've seen the map where Ukraine was in Tsarist Russia, in the Soviet republics, Ukrainians, most, but not all, or well, let me say many, but not all, are Orthodox like the Russians. Um, they are simply not seen as having a legitimate right to a separate history. And I'm not making this up. You can read Vladimir Putin's recent speech where he ranted against them. Uh, that makes it easier for them, of course, to view these people as not having any legitimate national concerns, certainly not uh, autonomy and movement towards the West. A critical factor in all of this is the lack of democracy in Russia. Why does that, why does that matter? Well, for one thing, Putin has no accountability. He doesn't have to worry about being voted out if this doesn't work. He doesn't have to worry about uh, a free press or, or a, a Russian version of MSN or nasty editorials that will criticize them. If they come up, he simply removes them, puts them in prison uh, and, mo and moves on. Not being accountable, accountable gives him enormous uh, amounts of power. There are no challenges 
there are few, let me put it, challenges at the top. Um, political leaders who have tried to challenge him, uh, whether Khodorkovsky, a former oligarch, or Navalny, a brave dissident, are removed, are put in prison, or even killed. Um, so if he surrounds himself with a very, very small group of people, uh, several things happen. No one disagrees with him. No one tells him the world isn't the way he sees it. No one tells him what's going, really what's going on. And uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't get an accurate picture and he's not vulnerable. That's important because the information he creates is, is exactly that. It's one he's created and he's not subject to information which might challenge his view. Who's going to tell him? Who's going to sit down across that long table and yell down the end? You know, you're getting your butt kicked. And you, the Ukrainians really don't like us. And there are, are numerous articles um, which talk about what he really believed would happen. The Ukrainians would welcome him. This is just a corrupt regime at the top, he would swoop in and remove it and they would be welcomed. Uh, of course, that wasn't true then and it's not true now. It's not even clear if he knows if he knows that. So the lack of, and there's no accountability anyway. You have a deep, profound suspicion of the West as um, um, condescending to the Russians, as wanting to make them into the West uh, and, and create, um, uh, a kind of mini version, which would be, of course, subordinate to Western, to uh, Western rule and money. And um, this is going to sound uh, odd to an American, but most Russians know that when the Russian Revolution occurred in 1917 and the year after that, uh, during then and the year after that, the United States, Great Britain, and France landed troops in Archangel. They joined by the Japanese in the far in the Far East to try to stop the Bolshevik Revolution, keep them in the war, and prevent the Russians from overthrowing the Tsar and replacing it with with Lenin. They were unsuccessful. When prior to the Second World War, prior to the U.S. involvement in the Second World War, of course, from the West, from Russian point of view, the West was happy to sell out Czechoslovakia in 1938. Uh, to Hitler and the Munich Agreement, looked the other way when that country in the East was absorbed. Uh, when the war eventually did break out, in nine, uh, uh, when Hitler attacked uh, Russia in 1941, the West would not open a second front and did not land in Europe until 1944. So from the Western point, uh, Stalin's point of view, Russian point of view, by the way, some of you may know, the Russians don't even call it World War II. It is called the Great Patriotic War. And the West sure took its time opening a second front. All of these, if, then if you add uh, other more recent elements, add a profound suspicion of the West and its influence. Blending with that is our visions of empire. These are apparently, we don't actually know this, but from what everyone seem, who knows Putin seems to say, there are visions of empire. And after all, all the great czars who are lauded in Russian history are, are in, on that level because they expanded the empire. And that's what Putin seems to have in mind, that Russia is and should be an expanding empire. And if you plug in the fact that they don't view Ukrainians as separate people anyway, uh, and who's going to tell them different, you have the, uh, the scaffold, really, for uh, an invasion at, at, the, at whatever opportunity. The proximate causes I would put as these. Most importantly, the expansion of Western organizations and influence. This was the, war, this was the world, the European world, from roughly 1948 to 1989. This is the Cold War Europe that the Soviet Union dominated fully half of Europe under its com almost complete control, reinforced by invasion in Czechoslovakia and Hungary, threatened invasion in Poland, non-aligned countries in, um, in Scand well, a subordinate Finland, non-aligned countries uh, in uh, Sweden and Yugoslavia, neutral Austria. That's a powerful European presence for the Soviet Union. And now the world looks quite different. 
This is the EU and its growth. Students in Professor Dudek's class will find this map familiar. Um, the original six having formed in 1957, the UK, um, Denmark and Ireland in 73, Greece in 81, Spain in 86, all while the Cold War was still going on. Austria, Finland and Sweden at the end of the Cold War in 95, and then you begin to get into East Europe. The Big Bang of the three Baltic countries and the other East, five East European countries in, 19, in 2004, followed by Romania and Bulgaria. And this map actually isn't even up, isn't even up to date because as of 2013, Croatia joined. So here's a map of the EU. Well, let me uh, give you the contemporary uh, picture. Uh, let's be honest, that's quite a different map uh, than the one you saw before. That's, that's a, remember these countries doing this are, um, they are economically uh, influential, they are democratic, and oh, and there's the European Union's partnership program that I mentioned. So the European Union made it clear they wanted to extend their influence in these countries. And as Ukraine was especially a pride and especially important in Poland. But then we come to NATO, uh, originally formed in 1949 to counter Soviet uh, control of. East Europe, uh, Turkey and Greece in 52, the Western part of Germany, Federal Republic as it was known then in 55, uh, Spain once it became a democracy, the rest of Germany in 90 after the end of the Cold War. And then you add the three uh, Central European states and then the rest of these um, in 2004, Croatia and Albania, in 2009, and even two years ago, North Macedonia. This is, from the Russian point of view, an enormous encroachment of Western economic, political, and military influence right up to its borders. And if you go, if you add, if you think of what those borders were, and you add the fact that they don't consider the Ukrainians separate people anyway, they're right on their doorstep. A crucial date in this NATO expansion was, nine, was 1999. As some of you may recall or may have studied, after the, after the civil wars in Yugoslavia, when NATO was very, and the US were very slow to do anything to help the Bosnians, um, the Serbs, the remaining part of Yugoslavia, Serbia, had 2 million Albanians inside whom they were loading onto trains, putting into camps and gave every indication of we're going to um, mistreat and maybe kill. And the United States uh, in, intervened as they had not in Bosnia. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright made it very clear, we will not let you do to the Albanians what you did to the Bosnians. And so the United States went to war with Serbia and so did NATO. We went to war with a country which had not attacked us or any NATO country. We declared war on it, we intervened domestically, we bombed Belgrade. We did so to protect the Albanians who are now in their own country called Kosovo. Now that it sound seems to me, it seemed to me then, it seems to me now a uh, um, part of the so-called uh, responsibility to protect. I'm glad we did it. To, to instead of looking the other way, but from the Russian point of view, it gave the lie to the idea that NATO was just a defensive alliance. NATO wasn't. NATO was gonna tell other countries how to treat their minorities, how to run their country. And if you didn't agree with them, they were gonna bomb you, which we did um, in Serbia. So from the, uh, the Russia, from the Russian point of view, now the Russians couldn't do anything about it in 1999, but it was an indicator to them that NATO was hardly um, uh, a defensive alliance. And the world didn't look like this anymore. Now it looked like this. And next in line, next up, were Ukraine and Georgia. And that is not just a theoretical construct or a metaphor because 
In 2008, NATO heads of state agreed that these countries, Ukraine and Georgia, would become members of NATO in the Bucharest Declaration. We made it very clear that that, that, that was going to happen. Um, one of the things I found, um, this was kind of a remarkable opportunity. I was asked by the State Department around this time to go to Ukraine and Georgia to give talks about NATO. To their credit, it was not, I was not to be a propagandist or, or uh, beat the drum in favor, just to give a lecture as I am now, so the Ukrainians and the Georgians could learn more about it. In Georgia, which is absolutely fascinating, extraordinary country, I found remarkable unanimity in favor of joining. In Ukraine, not so much. People in Kiev were in favor, but in, depending on what part of the country I went, there was a good deal of skepticism. I had people challenge me in the audience. Why are you doing this? Why is NATO causing uh, this warfare? Why is NATO um, willing to go to war to expand? I was surprised. I also, I mentioned, I showed you on the map, Konotop, I had the unbelievable experience of going back to Konotop virtually 100 years to the day that my grandfather had left and meeting people there and talking about what Konotop is and now and saying, well, here I am uh, talking, uh, talking about NATO. But there's another aspect as well. It is not just geostrategic. The, one of the most significant threats represented by Western organizations is the spread of democracy. I hope you can see uh, all, of the, all of this. this. These are measurements of democracy put out by Freedom House. Me democracy can be measured. There are various indicators. Freedom House is one of the mes most respected. Seven being the highest measurement on things like freedom of election, freedom of person, of uh, right of assembly, uh, freedom of religion, criminal from criminal prosecution, also a whole range of indicators, and they add up to a democracy score. And new EU members, since before they were joining, have a pretty good average, with seven being the highest ranking. They have done very well. Now, there's been some regression, which you're probably aware of. In Hungary, you see how the number has dropped. In Poland, the number has dropped. But if you compare them to the non-Baltic former states, the Baltic states are in the EU, you have a much lower average. Democracy has not taken hold in those states which are not members of the EU, certainly not in Russia, whose number has gone from 342 to 139. But in Ukraine, it has done the best of any of these. The Ukrainian democracy is flawed, it's corrupt, uh, it's cumbersome, there are problems with it, we can hardly be um, too arrogant about that. Um, but Ukraine and Georgia have both done quite well. Therefore, by doing so, they pose an, an, an even greater threat to Putin and his Russia. If the Ukrainians can do it, if they can have elections and free press and free assembly and individual rights, uh, then, then there will be those in Russia who will want the same thing. And the Ukrainians represent a tremendous threat precisely because of their success. So I mentioned that. Now here's an additional factor that I think is important, and it's an ironic one. Putin's increasing power. Because his vision, and because he's the Vosges, he's leading things, but he, his power makes a difference. Putin, this is, this is a chart of his, of his rise uh, to power, with including my favorite picture of him on the horse. And the picture down on the right is when the President Medvedev came to Pittsburgh, actually, uh, and addressed our students. From prime minister, he became acting president, then was elected president 2000, 2004, reelected. In 2008, at that time, the Russian constitution stipulated no one could be president for more than two terms in a row. Not a problem, says Vladimir. He became prime minister with his, with his poodle Medvedev uh, as president. So 
um, he held on there. And then having a gap in there, was elected president. By then, the Constitution had been changed, giving him a six-year term. And then he was reelected to a second six-year term, which he's currently in. But that was not enough. At his request, the Constitution was changed again. And the, the limit on two terms remains, by the way, it's one of the hilarious ways they changed the Constitution. But the, by setting up the new Constitution, they declared that his previous holding of presidency did not count. So he could be president now, who knows, because to give a future date uh, wouldn't, let's say, 2032, because they could change it again. But his power has increased, and that's only, of course, institutionally, the the gathering together, the submission of the oligarchs, the pressure against dissidents, murdering his opponents, um, and totally hijacking, uh, and the Russian state has it has has only increased. Um, which means that, of course, if democracy were were to occur, he could be removed, which he can't now. He could be prosecuted for his acts, including stealing billions, and so could all of those around him. I, I, um, it's, not, it's not the whole story, though, because a crucial factor has been the changing of the relative power balance at the end of the Cold War. In the immediate post-Cold War setting, it was quite different than it is now. The United States was the big dog astride the world. This is some refer to it as our unipolar moment. We could do anything we wanted. We, we, we um, pushed the Iraqis out of Kuwait in 91. We bombed Serbia, as I mentioned. Nobody could stop it, even if they protested. This was the period of the end, so-called end of history, Francis Fukuyama's famous um, indication that the struggle was over, the Democrats have won. Uh, an, an extraordinary gap in that piece, for example, is not mentioning the power of Islam, but that's subject for a different talk. EU expansion was muscle-bound during this period. And you saw that the numbers right up to 2004, NATO expansion, you saw those numbers. At that time, there were few and weak challenges. China was not the economic powerhouse it is now. It, was just, it wasn't really, hadn't really even entered the global economy. And Russia was uh, flat on its back, frankly, and struggling with virtually everything. It was also a relatively peaceful time. This was the period of the Oslo Accords in the Middle East, 1994, and the Budapest Agreement, which we'll come back to. Now, so that was then, roughly end of Cold War, let's say 1990, to about 2004, 2005, it's messy and boundaries. Now you have a period where the EU has reached its high watermark, the end of expansion, after, 2000 and after 2007, really, but 2013 with Croatia, um, the next candidates are, uh, have fallen uh, out, like Turkey, or will take some time, like, um, like the Balkans. Uh, EU treaty was rejected in 2000, by the voters in 2005. The EU demonstrated, seemed at the turn of the century, um, to be... Uh, on the pinnacle of power, um, Leonard, I forget his first name, David Leonard, I think, wrote a book called Will the EU Rule the World in the 21st Century? And he answers, his answer was yes, because he said soft power, the power of the EU model, uh, will determine it. And it turned out not to be true. Turkey was the, probably the most significant example. Even more crippling has been the inability of the EU <clears throat> to keep the Poles and the Hungarians on a democratic track. Um, they, they haven't been able, they threatened, they might eventually suspend some money, but Poland and Hungary have regressed, not only on democracy, but on migration. And of course, you had Brexit. NATO too reached a high watermark. Its expansion ended, although it just added North Macedonia in 2020. Um, uh, it had a role in Afghanistan, which ended. And over this period, you've seen challenges to US influence and authority, which seemed so preeminent and so predominant on, until this period. One, of course, was 9-11, the, 
the greatest country in the world, the most secure, the most powerful, could lose 3,400 of its citizens and attack in its homeland, well, that's a day none of us will forget and a, a, an effect on US capacity and influence that reverberates. Catas equally um, detrimental to our influence were the ill-conceived and certainly um, ill-perpetrated war in Iraq, the long uh, and, 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 and ultimately humiliating disengagement in Afghanistan, the rise of China. Some people will complain, and especially politicians, will whine about the decline of US power. And of course, that is part of the story, but it's also a story of relative power. And China has, has grown from being a blip on the screen to being a major factor in trade and investment in commodities um, and, is a, and with the Belt and Road Initiative, spending trillions of dollars around, around the world. Over the same period, sadly, we have seen a decline of the US as a model of democracy. Remember those Freedom House scores? If you look at the Freedom House scores for the United States, they have declined in the last decade based on a lot of factors, uh, some longstanding like institutional racism and some more the, the, the acts of uh, irresponsible, incompetent and dangerous politicians. In addition, speaking of incompetent and dangerous politicians, the last president uh, spent more time undermining our alliances and attacking our allies um, and putting trade sanctions on some of them than he did in supporting, and most importantly, calling into question um, uh, the, the role of, of NATO. And all of this is before the, the horrific insurrection that took place in the United States last January 6th. So if you're the Russians looking at the United States, you see a country which is uh, divided, has lost authority, uh, has irresponsible uh, leadership, um, and may not be able to pull together a response if you decide it's finally time to put those nasty Ukrainians in their place. At the same time, that that's happening, Russia's own power has grown. I mentioned how weak it was in the 90s. Um, and uh, uh, um, that was began to be reversed, their inter intervention in Georgia, which I, I, meant, I haven't mentioned, but they took out two pieces of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which they still, they created little mini states. They intervened in Ukraine, which I mentioned. They were successful in creating both Nord Stream 1 and 2, a pipeline um, uh, to bring gas into Germany and to avoid Ukraine in doing so, meaning that they would weaken the ability of Eastern and Poland to have any influence over it. Nord Stream 2 has, uh, was, is a, a victim of this war. In addition, you see huge involvement of Russians in many countries, including the United States. Uh, and cyber attacks, disinformation, supporting divisive and right-wing candidates, not just in the United States, but in Great Britain. They were big supporters of Brexit, for example, and in France. They've tried to exercise along with, with uh, Xi Jinping a reverse Kissinger, that is, um, get together with China to balance US influence. It's a whole other story, but the Chinese share their view about West <coughs> encroachment. And they had the enormous advantage of having a complicit, weak, unprincipled, incompetent, and ignorant president who was absolutely willing to um, support everything uh, Putin wanted to do, even the meddling in our own, in our own elections. Um, and when he was asked about it, he supported Putin's point of view rather than the American intelligence agent. He precipitously pulled out support from the Kurds and would have done so in Syria if uh, his generals hadn't stopped him. He threatened, he, he did in fact deny crucial aid to Ukraine until they came across with dirty information on his political, I mean, it, the list is, the list goes, goes on and on and that weakened the United States and certainly helped uh, the Russians. Um, now, here we get into um, more what you might call speculative causes. 
These are things that seem likely, but we really don't know. Did he get a green card from, uh, a green light, I guess, from China at the Olympics? There have been some suggestions it's that, that Xi said as long as he waited till after the Olympics, it would be okay. We don't really know that. It was winter in Europe, we do know that, which he expected that the, the Europeans would therefore not be willing to challenge and cut off the purchase of heating, heating resources, oil and gas. Um, the US exit from Afghanistan was calamitous and embarrassing and humiliating and reminiscent of the departure from Saigon. It had to have encouraged Putin and the Russians that the US and the, we, and the West didn't have the stomach to stand up to him. And of course, the division in the US over, for example, COVID had to, and of course, supported by Russian trolls and involvement, supported the idea that the US was weak and could not come up with a unified response. My personal favorite, which nobody uh, ever talks about, and when they do, it's mostly to tell me I'm wrong, um, was that he had a, that he wanted to inflict a major loss on Biden uh, before the midterm elections. He would much rather have Donald Trump and his party, who are, of course, completely obsequious before him, he would much rather have them in power. So if he could take over Ukraine and leave the US bumbling, um, then so it's possible that that had effect. Um, I'm coming up, I have two more points, or a point about the demands and some speculations about how it all might end. This is what the Russians want. This is taken right from their statements of what they want. When they say they're negotiating <clears throat> with President Zelensky, they really mean they're laying down ultimatums. They want, this is ironic, of course, they want Ukraine to cease military actions, no mention of their own brutality. They want Ukraine to change its constitution, to enshrine neutrality, no joining NATO. They want it to acknowledge Crimea as Russian territory and recognize the independence um, of Donetsk. That's what um, was presented <clears throat> at the first negotiating session, and one presumes that will be the Russian talking points, such as they are, uh, going forward. What they really want overall, just whatever the details, is a subordinate Ukraine. They want regime change. They want weekend. They want what I call a Vichy, a Vichy Ukraine. Uh, a Ukraine that is subordinate and does what Russia wants, even if they're not occupied that they will just do the Russian bidding the way the Vichy French did Hitler's in World War II. They certainly want an end to Western influence in Ukraine, financial and trade and democracy. And just in case anyone didn't get the message, they wanna make sure that Georgia and Moldova do get the message and do not move forward uh, with any kind of uh, overtures towards uh, NATO. And if possible, roll back the Western gains in Ukraine, which as you've seen, were substantial, both in terms of democracy and finance. All right, how, how could this possibly, how could this end? Um, I, 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 I think it's always instructive to think of all possible scenarios and then to explore them and see whether they have any chance of occurring in it, that sort of highlights the factors. I consider the, these to have low probability. Conquer the entire country and occupy it. It's too costly. He'll, he'll have a country of rubble um, and, and, uh, and, and, the, and of course, one of guerrilla warfare and hostility. Conquering the whole country isn't necessary. Uh, to get what he wants. You'll see in my next scenario. A Russian defeat, oh, I was wrong, you were right, and a withdrawal, of course, that's very low probability. It would mean the end of Putin. A NATO and US intervention, well, you can see that's why we're not doing anything, and that's why it's so terrifying, the recent bombing that came so close to a NATO border. Some say, well, the Russian people won't stand for it. 
the domestic upheaval will bring Putin's regime to an end because the Russian people want their credit cards. They want to be able to travel to France. Um, they, they just want to be like normal Europeans, and now they're not. They're cut off. Well, let's remember what Pasternak called the Russian people's accursed capacity for suffering. I, I, just, I just don't see it. I, I can't, you know, the Russian the FSB cracked down on any possible upheaval of demonstrations. And I, I, can't, I can't imagine there would be enough of this to get rid of Putin and end this war. I would say a low medium probab probability is Chinese intervention, intercession, meaning that the Chinese say to the Russians, Let's negotiate a ceasefire. We'll help you. We'll act as an uh, as a um, an intermediary. The Russians, Chinese, have a huge stake in Ukraine uh, in terms, of, and they're not likely to want to go up against the United States in terms of sanctions. They have a lot to gain for having this end, and Putin might listen to Xi. It could be a coup in Russia. <clears throat> you know, there have been some talk that. Uh, he's not really afraid of the oligarchs who have lots of money and influence depending on him, but they have no access. But the security services, the Silovki, as they're called, the most powerful group at the top, uh, could engineer a coup. That's probably why he sits at the long table so none of them can get close enough to kill him. Uh, and you notice that he recently already dismissed and or arrested the heads of several organizations. It's not, it's not impossible. I would say a medium probability is that he, he, the Russians, conquer half the country. You can imagine the scenario. The Russian troops take the east, eastern part. They surround Kiev and several other cities, but they don't. They only threaten it. They don't attack it. They might even have humanitarian corridors. And then he says, OK, this is what I want. And if you do that, Kiev will be spared. Kharkiv will be spared. It's too late for Kharkiv. But other cities, Zhitomir, will be spared. <clears throat> um, and he offers talks. The Ukrainians, I won't say capitulate, but with this huge threat and NATO sitting on the sidelines, they agree. He declares victory. He, he's the savior of Ukraine. He, that's very important to be able to say that this is all worth it. Uh, uh, and and he goes home. Uh, I, I see that as having the what I call the medium pro probability. <clears throat> um, and at least it has the uh, advantage of ending the killing. And this time we've seen just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary heroism. And we have to remember these are people who are suffering from because of these visions and empires and global politics. And this is what Churchill said when Great Britain was facing the same thing at a time when I might also point out the United States was not fighting the war on the side of Britain. And then President Zelensky's remarkable statement when offered an evacuation. One can only hope that the Ukrainian people uh, survive this and that their bravery is rewarded um, and that we are still around here uh, to uh, discuss the consequences. If you're inclined to donate, uh, I have these, I can send uh, Professor Dudek these links. These are not individual Ukrainian charities, but there are articles which, which discuss which are the um, the ones that the most trustworthy. Thank you for your kind attention. I am ready for your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Linden. Um, that was a lot of information, incredibly <laughs> enlightening. <clears throat> um, I'm always amazed how Professor Linden can encapsulate all of this history and all these seemingly disparate, dis, dis, disparate events happening around the world and bring it all together. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the floor up to questions and you can either um, use the raise hand function and I'll call on you, or you can send me a chat directly and I will read the message to 
uh, Professor Linden. So either one is fine to either send a chat or um, use the raise hand function, if you will, and I'm happy to call on you. And I like to give students the first uh, the first sure. dibs. Sure. So I see a uh, question from Olivia uh, Valley, who is in my uh, politics of the EU class. So let me see here. I want to Olivia, can you unmute yourself? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, so a few days ago, I was watching a video about a man in Ukraine who was on the phone with his father in Russia. And the dad had asked him like, oh, how's your week going? And he responded, horrible. We're evacuating right now. I'm terrified for my son's life. And that the dad in Russia just refused to believe his son and was like what are you talking about like no nothing's happening and it was just very haunting how much it reminded me of um my mom and i watching a documentary about january 6th and then my grandfather refusing to believe january 6th and saying that it was black lives matter protesters so um just a general question about democratic backsliding aided by like propaganda in modern social media uh, that that's a, a good question, Olivia, and I'm really glad you mentioned that because actually I probably should have included that factor in one of the uh, probable outcomes because a huge number of Ukrainians have relatives uh, in Russia, whether they're Ukrainian or Russian. And I have heard uh, episodes of what you just described where people, uh, where they talk to their even close relatives who have no idea what's what's going on their own grandchildren their cousins their family are in are in danger in their name and they don't and they don't know it and one could hope i suppose that that would cause some uncertainty some discomfort uh some questioning of the media enough so that some real unhappiness surfaces uh, now, it's going to take, you know, if you know psychology, you know how difficult it is to get people to change their point of view from, remember, he's been, you know, just uh, bombarding them with, with information seconded by Donald Trump, by the way, that these are just corrupt, they're even Nazis, uh, and to believe that this is not the case totally would take, would take quite, quite a leap. Um, it's not, it's not impossible. Um, I, I will say, you know, when the Russian, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan um, and the body bags came home with young soldiers, one of the most powerful forces turned out to be the Russian mothers whose sons were coming home dead from what they were told was a police action. And eventually they managed to end that war, but it took six years. I'm not sure the Ukrainians have six years, but I'm so glad you mentioned that as a factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have another question from Sharon Phillips. How real is the direct threat to the US outside of nuclear war? And that was in parentheses, in terms of cyber attacks, et cetera. Oh, in terms of cyber attacks, it is it is absolutely very real. Um, the the and the thing that makes it so real is that it can all be done remotely. You know, we don't have to look for spies skulking around in this, you know, in Central Park. They can do it remotely. And the Russians are are very skilled. And we have put some uh, um, efforts into defending <clears throat> against that. Uh, but I would say it that, that, you know, there's a high probability. And it, and it doesn't even have to be a bloody attack. You just kill the Internet or uh, disable gasoline pumps or undo cir closed circuit TVs. Um, and you, you think how dependent we are on, on, I mean, I try to keep track of this by getting on the internet every day. Um, so I would say that is certainly something I, I think we are putting uh, resources into blocking. Um, uh, and I imagine the Europeans are, uh, Europeans are as, as well. Uh, you know, there's a, a challenge for democracies, of course, because we believe in freedom of information. 
So if someone stands up and says, I'm voting for Brexit, even though it isn't really a good idea, are they a Russian troll or are they a North Englander who's disgusted with their country's immigration policies? It's a good, it's, a, it's something to worth pay attention. As for nuclear war, I, as <laughs> Scott O'Hara said, I'll think about that tomorrow. <laughs> Um, I'm going to call on uh, Professor Fritz, who has his hand up. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Professor Linden. Um, just an unbelievably informative and well-structured talk that's so useful in so many ways. Um, I really like the way you broke down the proximate um, sort of uh, uh, underlying and then the immediate causes, too. And that's kind of my basis of my question. So um, Looking at sort of where you, Ukraine was with NATO and EU and things like this, effectively, from my view anyway, that um, Ukraine was, was effectively blocked from ever getting into NATO when, with Donbass being occupied by Russian troops and the EU really wasn't going to do this. So it, it, it takes me to the sort of this NATO expansion and EU expansion as being sort of the, one of the, at least in the US, we're seeing this as a real debate, right, on whether this was uh, the US's fault for pushing this or Europe's fault for pushing all this kind of stuff. My view is that that sort of, um, given what you identified as underlying factors, I'm sort of in line with that in, in my own research, um, that, you know, Russia was kind of likely to do this, whether there was an expanded NATO or not. Um, and, you know, I sort of, I, I go back to Ukraine being effectively blocked from NATO expansion too there. So I'm just wondering your thoughts of this. It's sort of weighing, I guess, some of your underlying and proximate causes with this Do you, and whether you think sort of, let's go back to 1997, NATO expansion doesn't happen. Um, do we see something similar here, given what you've identified in Russian history and, and other issues? Oh, um, that's a, it's an excellent question, and I absolutely do. You know, uh, there are others, most notably, notoriously, John Mearsheimer, you know, who blamed the West for, but others too made this point. Um, and, and there, you know, it seems to me, if there had not been NATO expansion into East Europe, when Russia resu resumed, became powerful again, it would resume, it would desire again to want to control its neighborhood. And then Poland and Hungary and Slovakia would be faced with, with, with no alliance to prevent them. We'd be right back into that Cold War situation. Um, and, and there's also a moral position, which I thought Secretary of State Albright was brilliant at articulating that, you know, these are, these are now sovereign countries um, uh, who after many years of not having sovereignty and they have the right to decide what alliances they join, what alliances they they don't. Um, and she made that case, by the way, especially with regard to the Baltics. How could these countries, whom we talked about supporting all this time, and then they come to join and we say, no, sorry, you're still part of the big power politics and we're not going to let you in, which is essentially what we did to Ukraine. Um, I, I think the closest one can come, Ukraine, you might say Ukraine is different second largest country in Europe, the Russian heartland. That might be something you might want to give serious thought to. Um, you know, the Bucharest Declaration was, I hate to say this, pushed by the Republican right uh, during the campaign so they could show how tough they were of 2008. And when you go on record like that, it's awful hard to walk back. I think we're trying to find a way to walk back and walk it back now. Uh, so it's out there. Good question, though. Thank you, Professor Fritz. Uh, I'm going to call on Amy Oliver. Hi. So I have a question regarding all of the different companies that are pulling out of Russia, like commercial companies, Starbucks, McDonald's, Coke, Pepsi, and then also Russia restricting access to social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. And I was wondering what kind of effect that's going to have on people in Russia, because I know there's obviously a huge disinformation campaign and just like what is the impact of this? Boy, that's a question I should ask you, Amy, since uh, your generation is much more facile with social media than, uh, than I am and that, than we are. Um, 
and, and also have a, you probably have a better idea of sort of how important it is to your life. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I know how important it is to, let's say, the lives of your counterparts in Russia to not be able to get on Instagram and find out whether, you know, Kim Kardashian is still talking to whoever she's talking to. Is that really going to drive someone crazy? Um, in addition, <clears throat> this is a generation, actually, in this case, it's like the American and the European, that have lived relative at relative peace now for two or three decades, taking it for granted. Uh, and now they've lost both those privileges and, and the peace. Uh, will, will that be enough to drive them to challenge the regime or challenge the policies? I doubt it. Will that be enough? Now, here, here, this is hard to study, but will that be enough? And, and um, sitting next to the uncle who was called from Ukraine around the dinner table to say to their mother and their father and their cousin, this is terrible what we're doing. This is horrible. This is not true what we're hearing. We have to stop it. After all, here's something I do know something about. When the Vietnam War became you know, a subject to a lot of really unhappy Thanksgiving dinner conversations when I was young. And eventually the, you know, the middle-class party moved against it. Of course, that was in democratic terms. Um, now also, you know, being, being tech savvy, I imagine many young Russians can get around these limitations. But it's, it's, it's a question that's hard to answer right now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Professor Saf from the Geography and Global Studies Department. Oh, hi, Professor Linda. That was a great talk. Thanks. Um, uh, I have a few comments and, and questions, I guess, and I'll try and be quick. Um, the first is is uh, really I, I'll start with the obvious. I, I fully support Ukraine, and uh, I wish you know I wish we intervened even more strongly than we're doing. Uh, so I don't want anything to say to come out as, uh, as qualifying my support for the Ukraine. Um, however, I, just a couple of things. One, one relates to NATO and the other to Western Europe. Uh, the first with regards to NATO, uh, and this is, I spend a lot of time in Europe, and I remember having a conversation with someone in Spain saying, oh, you know, I'm actually personally, I'm a Lithuanian citizen, and, and so obviously I have my own concerns um, with the, my kid's draft age in Lithuania. So uh, I don't want him to be next. Uh, but ultimately, um, I was talking to somebody in Spain and said, you know, if, if the Baltics were attacked, you would have to defend them. And they said, are you crazy? I said, well, but, you know, NATO. So, well, you know, come on, is this real? And what that, that was some years ago, and it really got me thinking about the whole idea of NATO itself. The idea, um, what is NATO for? So for example, why would we have an alliance? where it is defined that an American would die to defend a non-democracy in Turkey, but completely uh, wouldn't defend a democracy in Ukraine. And so the idea that Trump, for example, uh, questioned the, the, the utility of NATO, I think just because of Trump doesn't mean you should uh, not question the utility of NATO. Uh, sorry. Um, and, and, in terms of utility of NATO, wouldn't it be make more sense to have a defense organization defined around the base of democracy rather than an anachronism coming out of the Cold War where, you know, even during the Cold War, non-democracies like Turkey, which not Turkey, uh, Portugal or uh, later Greece, which were not democracies, um, were, were then defined simply as an anti-communist movement. So that's my first point, the idea that, that NATO itself as an organization, to me, has no real utility because if we're not willing to defend democracy and we have non-democracies in NATO, then what is NATO for? So that would be my first question. The second one has to do with Western Europe, which is sort of missing from your discussion. I mean, for years, Western Europe was in a sense like a jelly donut when it came to defense, nothing. It was they were unwilling to spend on defense. They saw defense as History, I've spent time in Germany, I've seen the anti-NATO rallies. We have, you know, for all the, uh, you know, however you attack Trump, there's no equivalent to Gerhard Schroeder, the head of the SPD, an ex-chancellor who's on the board of a Russian company, pushing Nord Stream through. 
I mean, there's just no American equivalent to, the, to some of that in Western Europe. So again, I think we have to put Western Europe into this equation because when Trump's factoring, it's not Trump, when Putin's factoring into an invasion, he's also factoring into the fact that Western Europe as a military force doesn't exist. I mean, uh, and, and Macron, to his credit, is the only one over a number of years who has been pushing for an independent European defense. So I think we've got to be careful when we're looking at, at what's going on, A, to make America the center of this. Western Europe, this war is in Europe, and Western Europe is, is, has, has abrogated any, any, I guess, moral justification or any, any reality of defending itself. Uh, and secondly, I think it's really important to question NATO, not because I'm anti-NATO per se, I, I support a defense organization, but we need to define in a global society where threats are multifaceted, including China, we need to be looking at, at organizations aimed at defending democracy rather than just ad hoc old organizations coming out of a cold war. So there's my two cents, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, um, so Carolyn, can I have another hour? Yes, you may, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, those are of course uh, uh, great questions. Uh, let me take the second, the second one first. Uh, you're exactly right, I mean, the West Europeans have, uh, taken the rational course of action. Uh, there's NATO, there's the US uh, Defense Force, especially nuclear, which protects them. Uh, it doesn't make sense for them to um, uh, increase their defense spending or even have any defensive capability if the US is going to do the heavy lifting, as it has always done. Plus, their, their populations won't like it and might vote them out of office if they start getting higher taxes to pay for tanks. And isn't that what NATO is, is to, supposed to do? Now, having said that, however, one of the huge miscalculations Putin made was perhaps to see um, the absence of a defense capability in the West Europe as the absence of resolve. To his surprise, the Europeans have gotten together, even as you correctly point out, Germany, which has, after all, made a career uh, out of importing oil and gas and, and financial involvement, uh, have been willing to go so far as to cut that off. Uh, and, and the squabbling Europeans have showed an extraordinary level of resolve. They don't have a military capacity, but in terms of other things that um, Russians or Putin might care about, and certainly um, mis misunderestimated, as George Bush would have said, uh, they have they have stood up. The NATO and democracy question is is of course a, an old chestnut. Uh, uh, when NATO um, NATO uh, requires all members to be to adhere to the Washington principles, uh, which support democracy, it has no. Uh, equivalent of the acquis communautaire, which it evaluates countries, but it tries to uh, insist on democratic principles among its members. Uh, for example, uh, did not let Spain in until uh, after the, uh, the end of the Franco regime. And at the time, Turkey has gone back and forth. Turkey's a, <laughs> a tough one, uh, but it was more democratic than it is now. I think what happens in NATO is a balance between geopolitical concerns um, and moral principles. Uh, you're absolutely right. Not only did NATO have non-democratic countries, it had colonial empires like, you know, like Portugal um, and saw them as crucial to, it, to its time. Um, and, uh, but as a, as, a political, as a political counterweight, uh, I think it has been and continues to be uh, indispensable. It's true its roots came in the Cold War, uh, and now I think the Cold War has come back. So it may be one of the great things Putin has achieved is he's strengthened NATO uh, more than it ever could be without his intervention. Thank you. Um, I apologize, but we are out of time and I have a whole list of questions that people were typing oh. in. Um, but uh, I know students have to get to class for those that have class at this time. Um, so I really want to thank Professor Linden for an incredibly informational and enlightening talk and a very crucial issue that the whole globe is facing. Um, and for those of you who are my students, I'm happy to send you the information regarding um, places that you can help out to help the Ukraine. I'll forward that information on to all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Linden, and thank you for all of you. 
Thanks for inviting me. Thank you all for your terrific questions. Now I have to go revise this talk. <laughs> <laughs>